Joining us now, editor of Commentary Magazine, columnist at the New York Post, and contributing editor at the Weekly Standard, John Padoritz. And columnist for the Washington Post, Karen Tumulty. Join us. Uh, we'll get to your columns in just a moment. But first, several top, top tech companies have recently limited Alex Jones from spreading his conspiracy theories online, but not Twitter. In fact, Jack Dorsey, Twitter's co-founder and chief executive, says it's up to reporters to police Jones's claims, posting, quote, accounts like Jones's can often sensationalize issues and spread unsubstantiated rumors. So it's critical journalists document, validate, and refute such information directly so people can form their own opinions. This is what serves the public conversation best. Several journalists then posted screen grabs of them doing just that, offering hard factual reporting to contradict Jones's false claims, only to face more skepticism and attacks from Jones's supporters. This, Joe, is it's a long running controversy about what a platform is. Is it a publisher or not? And can they? completely separate themselves from any responsibility. Well, no, they can't. And they're the ones that are publishing the lies. Uh, and uh, Jack Dorsey's defense is is pretty remarkable. John Fedoritz, uh when you have uh, InfoWars founder spreading lies that actually endanger the lives of Sandy Hook parents, and he's sitting there going, well, it's not really up to us. To determine whether these are actors who were pretending that their six and seven year old children's bodies were riddled with bullets on the Friday before Christmas vacation. That's really up to journalists to figure that out. I, I, I don't understand. Uh, I mean, it, as David French said, you know, if it's slander, if it's a lie, then isn't that the best measure of whether you publish it or not? Okay, so. This goes directly to the heart of corporate strategy of social media companies, right? So there is a provision in the law and has been governing this for two decades that basically treats information that travels over the internet as though it is a, it is a letter inside an envelope. And Twitter and Facebook and your email companies and all of that are, are held harmless by the law uh, because they're like the Postal Service. They're not responsible for what's mm -hmm. inside the envelope, right? That's the, that's the legal theory. Uh, it's not legal theory. It's how, it's how the law works now. That is unsustainable uh, because it is not the case that Twitter Correct. and Facebook are simply delivering mail <laughs> from one right. person to another. Yeah. These are public, free access sites and um, I think there is going to be an enormous amount of pressure over the next couple of years to compel these companies to I mean there are a change in the law that says that they are right. not harmless for the information that is that is pervaded on their site now I think there are well, well, yeah. Well, and, and, yeah and you know John they actually profit from spreading lies from from spreading slander. And if any public figure tries to speak out against it, then that generates more hate, which of course generates more traffic, which benefits Twitter even more. Jeff Greenfield wrote this after Twitter said, uh, we strongly believe Twitter should not be the arbiter of the truth. Uh, Jeff Greenfield uh, responded, so if someone tweets that Jack Dorsey presides over satanic child rape slaughters at Twitter headquarters, you don't know how to be the arbiter of that truth. Hmm. Calling Sandy Hook a fake is not a viewpoint, for God's sake. And, and uh, Karen, you have the same person uh, uh, talking about how Robert Mueller is at the middle of a child uh, kidnapping ring. I mean, the, again, there's absolutely no defense for any of this speech. It's slander, and it. Sh I, I don't understand why Twitter's dragging their feet here. Well, I think that corporations are struggling to sort of figure out what's the line between speech that is offensive and speech that is actually harmful. 
And, you know, it is a difficult thing. And, you know, the free speech, now corporations are not bound the way the government is to respect freedom of speech. Well, well, well Karen, the, just to step in here, though, how difficult is it uh, to figure out whether, whether it's slanderous and whether it's acceptable or not uh, to spread rumors that... Uh, that, that led to Pizzagate, that led to the shooting at Pizzagate, or that Sandy Hook parents are just actors and actresses who are now having to actually move from one place to another to another because the hatred spread on Twitter and other sites are actually leading them to fear for their lives. Well, my own opinion is that Alex Jones has definitely crossed that line. And the, the issue for Twitter is going to be you know, potentially this may be something that ends up getting settled in court and costing them a lot of money. But it, you know, it's mm -hmm. a, a business decision. And the fact that so many other social media platforms see it so clearly, um, you know, I, I don't know what is going on in Twitter's business model where they think that this is like a good idea. Um, can I just, yeah. yeah. I mean, because if, Jump in. if, it's a bad idea. I mean, if Twitter is supposed to mediate its the, the comments, Twitter's an unsustainable business. I mean, God knows. I mean, there are five, ten million tweets a day. Every every one of them under an editorial policy would have to have a, a, an eye cast on it by a Twitter employee to approve it before it goes up. Uh, that is not any way that that company can can manage. So, no. Part of the car counter argument to this is that. Um, if you take hate speech, we're talking about libel, slander, and even harassment, but if you take this as hate speech, that social media companies like Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter should not be in the position of determining what is hateful in speech and thereby putting people out of the public square who, whose worldview they disagree with. Now, Alex Jones may be a unique case, but the precedent of their deciding that could be problematic. Yeah, and then you'd have to define what can, what is hate speech. And if right. you're in the UK where they don't have a First Amendment, you can be prosecuted for things that you post on social media that run afoul of uh, certain guidelines right. and, and the extent to which you could punish people. I do not understand the, the re impulse among journalists to say, why doesn't Twitter police this speech? We don't want to have to do this. This is ridiculous. I don't want to have to address this. Why not? Uh, my, my impulse is always to say that the cure for the ills of free expression is always more free expression. The extent to which we are shutting this down, creating a taboo around it, isn't healthy. It's not going to make it go away. And Jones isn't a new phenomenon here. He was a 9-11 truther. Did anybody not relish yeah. debunking 9-11 truth conspiracies? No. That's the job. Everybody likes doing this. I don't understand why there's a reticence to engage this guy. He's a target. Yeah, no. There, there's a line. Uh, John Padora, it's moving now to your column. You write in the New York Post that there may be something behind President Trump's blame the media blitz. Talk about it. Okay, so my view is when, you know, last week as, as the, the heat, uh, Trump turned up the heat on the media, horrible people, enemy of the people, you know, uh, all of that, that it seemed weird because he had so much good news to bandy about, right? 4.1% uh, growth, 3.9% unemployment. This is what you want to talk about on the campaign trail, or a normal politician would probably want to talk about, is trumpeting successes and saying, vote for my people so we can, can get, keep this going. And that was not where all the energy was. So <laughs> I'm wondering whether somewhere in the back of his mind, or even as a possible deliberate White House strategy, the idea now is to that, that he is establishing the predicate for the reason that Republicans lose the House in November, which is to say, the fake news did it. The fake news yep. made me lose. And that, you know, if you think about it, when in 2016, when he kept refusing to say that he would abide by the results of the election because the election was rigged, this is a new way of saying the election. He can't say the election's rigged because Republicans yeah. run most of the electoral processes in the United States and the states, and he's the president, and they have the House and the Senate. So he's got to have another reason why he lost, exogenous reason that he can blame, and it's the media. This is vintage Trump. I mean, Karen, we'll get to your piece in just a moment, but... Um from our knowledge of his personality and the way he thinks, I don't think this is White House strategy. This is just what Trump does. This is his sweet spot. Well, he also is just a master of distraction, and the media is mm -hmm. one of his favorite ways of doing that. And in part, I, I mean, I fault the media here because 
we essentially swing at every pitch he throws over the plate here. So um, it, it is also a way of turning the conversation from places that he doesn't want it to be. That's actually exactly. a great baseball metaphor. Exactly. It's like you're watching your, your, your favorite team and watching uh, your, uh, a batter swing at one low, uh, an outside pitch after another. And that's, that is what the media has been doing for the first 18 months of the administration. Every tweet is breaking news. Every insult is a, is a screaming headline. That's exactly what he wants. What he doesn't want, Karen, is uh, he doesn't want uh, Americans to read stories about what you say Trump Republicans should be worried about, which is, uh, again, the reason I got in to Congress in 1994 was about the rising deficit, the rising debt. It was at $4 trillion then. It's at $21 trillion now. And Trump is spending, uh, biggest spending bill ever passed by this Republican Congress because of Donald Trump. Mm. And it's really, I mean, Trump also, by the way, ran on the promise that he would not only reduce, but that he would pay off the national debt. Um, he's going exactly the opposite direction. And it's really surprising how few conservatives are, are even willing to talk about the fact that, you know, the receipts to the government have gone down drastically thanks to tax cuts, that spending is growing, that Trump has taken entitlements completely off the table. And now Republicans are talking about a second round of tax cuts. All of this is ballooning the deficit to levels that we have never seen in a time of prosperity. Deficits usually go down when the economy is doing well. John, we've got to talk about Mission Impossible in just a second. But first, since we've exhausted our analysis this morning over almost three hours of Ohio 12, mm -hmm. what's yours? What happened last night? Uh, what happened last night is the Republicans lost the House. I mean, as I say, there are 23 seats. Uh, uh, Democrats need 23 seats. There are 24 seats uh, that uh, have Republican congressmen that Hillary Clinton won, right. the, won the CD in 2016. Uh, if any of them has a remotely credible candidate, the Democrat wins. Under these, under these, the thing that we saw last night is Democrats up 10 percent, Republicans down 10 percent. So no one survives that. And with Republicans and the president with their foot on the gas in that district trying to push him over the top. Yeah. Um, okay, Mission Impossible, your review, you write, one of the most astounding action-adventure pictures ever, the most entertaining picture of the year, based almost solely on your review. I took my kids to see it, and I agree. It was incredible. See, uh, we need That's to, the power of Padoritz. You need to support, trust content from John Padoritz. <laughs> I, I wasn't expecting to feel this way about the movie. Like, I, I find I've been very mad on most of the, this is the sixth Mission Impossible. First one was good, second one was lousy, third one was okay, fourth was kind of fun, fifth was okay. This just knocked me out of the back of the theater. Like, uh, you know, forget the plot. We were discussing oh, yeah. this. You can't understand the plot. I just don't get it. Don't try to follow the plot. And Tom Cruise still has it and then yeah. some. Yeah. So good. Don't you agree, Mika? I don't get it. Uh, John, no, I just, no. I'm taking John my Bedoris, kids thank today. You. Got uh, to. I'm excited about this. I'm going I'm not to. into all this stuff. Oh, and Karen you, Tumulty, you thank you very much. <laughs> thank you both. Coming up, President Trump has recently praised Saudi Arabia's leadership and hammered Canada's. Hmm. Now hmm. those two hmm. countries are locked in a growing diplomatic dispute. Will the U.S. take sides? The president might, but will the U.S.? There are two separate things there. <laughs> That's all next on Morning Joe. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube. And make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. And you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.